We have journeyed through the world of Tagore, learned about his teachings, his philosophy, looked at his paintings, reveled in his music and poetry interpreted through dance. Rabindranath Tagore was also one of the pioneers about emancipation of women. Through his stories, plays, and even paintings. Rabindranath's role in the liberation of Bengali women was a seminal one. Initially, he exposed the plight of women and argued for their autonomy through his letters, short stories, and essays. Through his novels, he was able to construct new and vital female role models to inspire a new generation of Bengali women. Later, by his act of admitting females into his Shantiniketan school, he became an innovative pioneer in education. And to talk to us about the, the role of emancipation of women is Kathleen O'Connell. Kathleen has done extensive research specifically on the female characters in Tagore's work. Dr. O'Connell teaches courses on South Asia at the University of Toronto. Her research in interests include Rabindranath Tagore, Shatujit Rai, and Bengali culture and literary history in general. Kathleen O'Connell presents From Home to Global Nest, Rabindranath Tagore's maturing sense of female education. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Manjula. It's always nice to follow waves of joy. As we have seen in this uh, symposium, the presentations from Shantaniketan to the Smithsonian, Rabindranath Tagore has made significant contributions to almost every area of human experience. And it is rather astonishing that someone born a century and a half ago should still present to us such a perceptive, cosmopolitan, and constructively relevant vision in so many areas. At the base of this relevance stands the exemplary and fascinating personality of Rabindranath and the choices he made during the conflicted times with such creativity, intellectual clarity, and social conscience. Choices that were always geared towards the creation of a cultured, open-ended human society that is inclusive of all and accepting of differences, that is flexibly democratic and nonviolent, where gender equality is recognized and the highest qualities of humanity can be cultivated. One of the areas in which Rabindranath sought to work out this vision was in the field of education, where my own research is focused. This is an area which has not found recognition in the West, and Rabindranath's educational theory and practice are rarely found on the syllabi of teachers' colleges. Yet Tagore's sensitive appreciation of children and the way in which they learn to relate to the ever-changing natural world and to each other still resonates with the needs felt today, as does his attempt to foster a broader type of education suited to a multicultural, multilingual, and multi-ethnic world. Tagore was also a champion of women's education and my paper today will trace the ways in which he created new awareness and new educational paradigms through his writings and his educational experiment at Shantiniketan. Rabindranath's interest in gender relations and female education can be traced to the Tagore joint family home at Joroshanko and their pivotal role in the socio-cultural transformation of 19th century Bengal. In describing the special qualities of his home, 
Rabindranath noted the unique openness to the range of human potential and emphasis upon various freedoms that were to be found within his own family. Qualities that he would assimilate and foster in his later works. Such qualities developed early in the family's history and were evident in the pre-colonial period. As Rabindranath wrote, I was brought up in an atmosphere of aspiration. Aspiration for the expansion of the human spirit. We in our home sought freedom of power in our language, freedom of imagination in our literature, freedom of soul in our religious creeds, and that of mind in our social environment. Such an opportunity has given me confidence in the power of education, which is one with life, and which only can give us real freedom, the highest that is claimed for humanity, the freedom of moral communion in the human world. I try to assert in my words and works that education has its only meaning and object in freedom. Freedom from ignorance about the laws of the universe and freedom from passion and prejudice in our communication with the human world. The members of the Joroshanko Takurbari, both male and female, played an integral role in the socio-religious, literary, educational, and nationalist currents that were taking place during the Bengal Renaissance period. Their role in helping to transform the lives of Bengali women was no exception. One can argue that the women's movement within India had its beginnings right within the Joroshanko joint family. Among the women, Rabindranath's older sister, Shorna Kumari, was one of the most distinguished literary figures of her time. Novelist, poet, playwright, songwriter, journalist, and social worker, Shorna Kumari wrote many books on a variety of topics and is considered a pioneer of the Bengali historical and romantic novel. Shorna Kumari also participated in the political arena and was among the first group of women who attended the annual session of the Indian National Congress in 1890. Sharna Kumari's daughter, Sharla Devi, who did not marry until the age of 33, actively participated in politics during Gandhi's non-cooperation movement. Sharla was the first in the Tagore family to have an occupation and salary after she accepted a highly paid appointment at Hyderabad's girls' school, something highly unusual for the times. Among the male members of the Tagore family, Rabindranath's brother, Satyendranath, stands out as one of the most progressive members of the family. And his wife, Ganada Nandini, became a role model for modern female behavior. Satyendranath persuaded his father to allow Ganada Nandini to follow him to Ahmedabad when he became district magistrate there. And in 1877, he sent her and the children to England with a British family where she learned English and some French during a visit to Paris. In doing so, Ganada Nandini broke many taboos, leaving the Antipur, appearing in mixed company that included foreigners, crossing the prohibited black waters, and traveling on her own. Not only did she redesign Bengali female dress to make it more appropriate for tra traveling from the Antipur, she contributed articles on female education and social reform to various journals. Rabindranath, who would visit Ganada Nandini in England, thus grew up in a household where the norms concerning women were changing rapidly and where women were beginning to assert their individuality. He made his first trip to England in 1878 at the age of 17, and some of his earliest statements regarding the need for more social freedom and independence for Bengali women come in a series of letters back to his family. After attending a party where British men and women mixed freely, Tagore wrote a letter contrasting the free mixing that occurred between men and women in England and the isolation of Bengali women who were confined to Porta and separated from the outside world. Wrote Rabindranath, 
It is only natural that men and women should seek amusement together. Women are a part of the human race, and God has created them as part of society. To consider the enjoyment of free mixing between people to be a cardinal sin, to be unsociable, and to turn it into a sensational matter is not only abnormal, it is unsocial, and therefore uncivilized. When, when Tagore returned from England, he was put in charge of the family estates in East Bengal. There, for the first time, Rabindranath had an extended exposure to rural society, to the sufferings of rural people in general, and rural women in particular. As a result, he began devising educational facilities and medical initiatives. This was the period uh, when, he, when many of his short stories were written, and we find him port portraying the plight of orphans and widows, such as Ratan in The Postmaster, and Kusham in Gater Kata, The Tale of the God, or the abuses of the dowry system and child wives, as is illustrated by the abuse of Nirupama in Dana Pauna, Profit and Loss, as well as the repression of female learning portrayed through the character of Uma in Kata. Rabindranath's most radical short story, Strir Putra, A Wife's Letter, came later. Here, the transformation of its main character, Renal, an upper caste woman, is portrayed from submissive wife to autonomous individual. In the end, she chooses to leave the Antipur, its restrictiveness, and, as she puts it, the shelter beneath her husband's feet. Not because of personal mistreatment, but rather because of the callous treatment of another female in the joint family that led her to suicide, as well as an oppressive atmosphere that inhibited personal development. Rabindranath continued his exploration of the female psyche in his dramas and fictional writings, which were innovative both in literary form and content. The publication of his novel, Gora, was significant for its delineation of young female characters and the manner in which they challenged the society around them. Such characters as Lolita, Sucharita, and Anandaboy are shown in the process of shaping new identities and personal autonomy as they develop alternate ways of interaction with men and society and negotiate interreligious and interracial relationships. The conceptualization of such vital characters signaled the potential for a new identity that Rabindranath upheld for the female students at Shantiniketan. As his perception regarding female empowerment progressed, one finds that the portrayal of women changes from a position of victim, such as the young widows and orphans in his earlier stories, to one of social dissenter. Other characters, such as Domini in Chaturanga, one of Tagore's strongest female characters, reject the patriarchal and religious norms that would oppress them, charting their own course with single-minded autonomy and intelligence. Significantly, the level of education of female characters increases in his later works, and such female characters as Lobonno and Sheshir Kobita and Ila and Charatyai have university degrees. They also exhibit a mature self-awareness and outlook on their society and relations with men. As well, they tend to have a more secular outlook. Rabindranath not, was not only involved in creating new paradigms for Bengali women in his fiction, he was also facilitating a new freedom for them in his educational scheme at Shantaniketan. The physical space of Shantaniketan, located 158 kilo kilometers from Kolkata, West Bengal, had deep associations for him. And the concept of the Shantaniketan ashram extended back to 1863, when his father purchased the land after having had a deep spiritual experience while resting there during the journey. It was also the environment in which young Rabindranath first experienced a sense of physical freedom within nature. 
Tagore, though, with his own educational experiences in mind, positive and negative, set out to create a learning environment that would help define education in the broadest manner possible, embracing life as a whole. He keenly understood that most learning occurs outside the boundaries of what is labeled formal education, and that no single model of education adequately covers the multiple levels of consciousness. Rather than the unimaginative, unchanging, encapsulated units favored by the formal education of his time, unstructured learning in the form of play and experimentation was given a high priority to encourage spontaneity and the ability to improvise. With a combination of poetic intuition and rational appraisal, he set about creating a learning environment that would place the child in a creative, fluid environment at a time when his or her senses were at their most receptive. As mentioned, the model for his educational experiment really was the family home, Joroshenko, which he called the living university, where much of the cultural exchange of that period took place. This cultural atmosphere of the Tagore home greatly out overshadowed whatever external schooling took place, and in many ways provides the model for his later experimental school. Rabindranath's 13 brothers and sisters were mathematicians, journalists, novelists, musicians, and artists. His uncles and cousins who shared the family mansion were leaders in theater, science, and a new art movement. Not surprising, he found the outside schooling very dull. As well as growing up in a household, which was the meeting place for leading artists and intellectuals from India and the West, Rabindranath had a further experience which was un uncommon for someone of his upbringing. In the 1890s, he was put in charge of the family's rural properties and began spending time in rural Bengal. His first experiments were in the area of adult education. And when he started his school, students and teachers were involved with literacy training and social work. Later, in 1922, with the help of Leonard Elmhurst, a British agronomist, Rabindranath initiated the Rural Reconstruction Center at Srinikaitan to promote rural education and village uplift. Rabindranath had wanted to include girls from the beginning of the school, but it not, did not prove practical until the end of 1908. The first six girls who had close associations with the ashram were boarded at Dehali, one of the homes, where they were looked after by the mothers and wives of the teachers. What made the experiment so innovative was that the girls were not put in separate classes, but rather joined the boys in classes, sports, and mondir services. Further impetus for the women's program came when Rutindranath was married to the talented Rutindranath uh, Tagore's son was married to the talented Protima Devi in 1910, and she began taking a prominent role in all facets of the ashram activities, particularly drama and the arts. Unfortunately, this phase of women's education, which involved boarding at Chantanikatan, was interrupted by several events that forced a temporary suspension of the girls' school. However, it did not signal an end to women's education because the daughters, granddaughters, and nieces of the teachers filled the places of the former students, and the classes and activities continued, though not in such an integrated manner. Other activities were continued through the women's groups that formed the Mohila Shabazz. Tagore began laying the foundation for the next phase of women's education with his essay, Stri Shika, Female Education, which was initially published in the journal Shubhuj Patra in 1915, and later translated as The Education of Women. And this period represents the most radical period of, of Tagore's writings. The essay states in no uncertain terms that there should be equality in education. Whatever is worth knowing is knowledge, writes Tagore. 
It should be equally known by both men and women, not for the sake of practical utility, but for the sake of knowing. The desire to know is the law of human nature. This was not to say, however, there should be no distinction in education. Knowledge has two departments, he continued. One, pure knowledge, the other, utilitarian knowledge. In the field of pure knowledge, there is no distinction between men and women. Distinction exists in the field of practical utility. Women should acquire pure knowledge for becoming a mature being and utilitarian knowledge for becoming a true woman. With the foundation of Vishabharati in 1921, women's education was formally adopted within the university. A residence known as Nari Bhavan was set up with a few girls, and it soon attracted girls from all over the country. Nari Bibag, as the section was called, consisted of 30 girl students, of whom 12 were boarders, and the rest billeted with guardians. Academically, the Vishabharati curriculum was the same for boys and girls, and it was carried out in a coeducational manner. Additional arrangements were made for the teaching of domestic science. The girls received special classes in cooking and ki kitchen work from an American nurse, Gretchen Green, who was attached to Srinikaitan. Along with the general social and cultural activities of the institution, the girls organized their own clubs, societies, and organizations. To foster the holistic, well-rounded education that Tagore believed in, girls were encouraged to participate in physical education as well. They engaged in games, sports, cycling, hikes, and excursions. And even the athletics of self-defense, such as lati play and jujitsu. In Srinikaitan, Durendra Roy, a former student, organized the Brati Balikas, Brati Balikas, literally boys and girls who have taken a vow, a group patterned after the Boy Scout Girl Scout guides and the American 4-H movement. Snailadas Shen, superintendent of Nari Bhavan, was responsible for the Brati Balikas. Co-educational initiatives help village children develop various practical skills, including preventive medicine, and help facilitate the reduction of caste prejudices through group participation. In order to facilitate the education of rural women, there were night classes and craft groups, as well as opportunities for distance education. The importance of female participation in dance, music, and drama in terms of developing a sense of creative autonomy has been well documented in biographical reports by those who have studied at Shantaniketan. As early as 1909, Rabindranath began a drama program involving female characters. They were at first reluctant to participate, but he solved the problem with a play called Lakshmi's Test which was directed by Protima Devi and involved only female characters. In a reverse situation, the boys sat, sat behind porta screens to watch the girls, since they did not want to perform directly in front of a male audience. In time, acting, singing, dancing, and co-educational staging of the plays became widely accepted. In 1922, when Tagore's drama Borshamangal was staged in Kolkata, it was the first time that Chantanaketan students, male and female, had appeared in public. The Call Above and courses were especially popular, and women proved adept at expanding the areas of alpana, batik, and embroidery. In conclusion, it has been seen how Rabindranath assimilated and carried forth the Tagore family ideals that had centered on freedom and full development of human potential, including female potential. Rabindranath's role included exposing situations that were oppressive for in individuals in all walks of life, but he was especially sensitive to the sufferings of women as they faced traditional views and expectations, as well as their own self-imposed limitations. 
He argued for their autonomy through his letters, short stories, and essays, and constructed fresh and vital images through his novels. And later, of course, by admitting women into his Shantanikatan school, he became an innovative pioneer in co-education. Not satisfied with imitating existing educational models, Tagore set out to create an alternative paradigm of learning that was based on education of the whole personality, be it male or female. At Bishop Arty, the academic curriculum for girls and boys was virtually identical, and it became a model for schools and universities throughout India. Participation in the arts played an especially important role in allowing women to express their personalities in a creative manner and to transmit these, these uh, values to their society as a whole. The courses, particularly the courses in the arts at Bishop Arati, provided the basis for female graduates to enter into careers as teachers, artists, and so on. It is hard to overestimate the social change and personal transformation that resulted through Vindranath's writing and his encouragement of women's particip participation in academic achievement, sports, dance, and creative expression. In the last years of Rabindranath's life, uh, as we've seen uh, from Professor Kumar's presentation, Tagore focused on paintings. And I would just like to finish off my paper uh, with a showing of some of Tagore's paintings of women in their diversity. This last one is especially interesting. You see Rabindranath at the very top of the, the triangle. Thank you. Dama.